Good evening, and welcome to Public Affairs Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters of Houston. A lot of things have happened this past month. Uh, there are uh, major news stories. Uh, they just seem to keep coming and coming and coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of those stories. It is September the 2nd of 2021, so last Two days ago, a day ago, the legislature's laws that they passed during the first regular session went into effect. There were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, 666 new laws uh, that are on the books. We are witnessing uh, political fallout uh, and, and possibly social and economic uh, consequences that are going to affect us here in Houston, I'm sure over the pullout from Afghanistan. And what we, what I promised that we were going to talk about tonight, last month, is redistricting, because that's on the agenda, that's on the horizon. Uh, the Census Bureau has finally released, started releasing the figures uh, that are usable, and so redistricting needs to happen it, by law, and it's going to happen. So that's, that's on the horizon, right? So with me tonight, I have uh, some uh, special guests. I'm going to start at the far end of the table and work my way back uh, toward me. And uh, we have Dr. David Branham, who is a professor of political science at the University of Houston downtown. To my left, we have Alex Blakowski, who is a uh, assistant professor. Yes. Not uh, much longer. Uh, a soon-to-be associate professor in a few days uh, of history at the University of Houston downtown. Uh, on Zoom with us tonight is Dr. William Flores, uh, also a professor of political science, and finally me, your erstwhile host. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, let's talk about the big news and work our way down. Uh, let's talk about Afghanistan. Alex? What got us involved in Afghanistan for 20 years to begin with? <laughs> well, it is, it's America's longest war. Uh, there's, there's no debate about that. It was a 20-year war. Uh, our initial reason to go there was because the Taliban were uh, directly implicated in the suicide attacks on 9-11. Um, and there was, that was not a debatable point. Uh, our first going into Afghanistan in the fall of uh, 2001 was supported you know, wholeheartedly by the international community. Uh, and I think th that really is not controversial. What's controversial is why we stayed and how long we stayed. I think that's the real controversy over this issue. Uh, did we need to stay this long? Um, I saw a meme today which, which said only, only the Americans could spend 20 years, billions of dollars, and turn the, the country over from the Taliban to the Taliban. Uh, and, and I know that's kind of slightly amusing and this really shouldn't be a funny topic, but the, the irony of that is, is so choice. We are turning it back over to the people we went there in 2001 to overturn. Uh, and so it raises all kinds of questions about, again, why were we there? Why did we stay there? What did all those billions of dollars and a couple thousand American lives and, and countless uh, Afghan lives, what did it give us? Uh, and I think those are all legitimate issues that, that people are debating right now because of how badly, unfortunately, things went with this, with this pullout. You know, this, this wasn't a surprise. I mean, uh, when I remember listening 10 years ago to uh, interviews with Petraeus, who was the commander, and he had said, we're not building an infrastructure there if we leave this was a decade ago. Things are going to be just as bad as they were to begin with. Um, but look, we know that this was the support for the pullout, right? We People on both sides of the aisle, all sides of the aisles, right, have been saying Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians, on all sides have been saying we've been there too long, we need to get out. Uh, not everybody, right? But, but, but there has been a consensus 
Um, and so when President Trump last year made steps and promised that we were leaving, actually in, in March, I believe. It was May 3rd, May, was his original okay. date. Yeah, um, May 3rd. I knew it was a month with an end. <laughs> um, you know, there was a sigh of relief from a lot of quarters. So, but we but we knew it was not, I mean, it's never easy to just, yeah. you know, you can't just say, well, see you guys. Uh, right. We had this happen in Vietnam. This pullout was a disaster there too, right? Yeah, I, I think what surprised everyone uh, is how quickly. I mean, I think there were, you're absolutely right. There's a, there was an overall consensus among almost everyone that we needed to get out. It, it had just been too long. Uh, and, and like you say, it, it didn't matter what your political stripe was. The only people I saw arguing against pulling out were, you know, died in the wool neocons and quite frankly, people who are shills for the defense industry. That's really the only people uh, who I saw saying, no, we should not pull out. Uh, so that, that's not a debatable point. And I, I think that's, that's important to get out of the way right away. Almost nobody with any serious stature was saying we should stay any longer. That was, that was a consensus. Uh, and, I, and, and likewise, I agree with you, Gene. I think most people recognized it, this government was not going to last. Um, and we're talking about the Afghan, the Afghan government. No, not, not our government. The Afghan government was not going to last. Um, but again, the rapid, how fast. I mean, when we left Vietnam, it was approximately two and a half years between when we leave Vietnam and the fall of Saigon, give or take a few months. I mean, this is like under, under 60 days. I mean, that's what I don't think anybody could have predicted is just how rapid. And that's why, if you remember, just about a month ago is, is in July, a little more than a month ago, Biden, President Biden was asked specifically, do you think this is going to be a Vietnam type situation? And he says, I have no reason to believe that's the case. They have a 300,000 man army, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe he was speaking honestly there. I don't think anybody thought it was going to fall this quickly. Mm -hmm. And that, that I think is what caught everybody by surprise, the sheer rapidity of which this happened. Bill Flores, what is this going to mean politically for the Democrats. I mean, Biden, this was done under Trump. Biden carried it out. What is this going to mean for his administration and for him going forward? Well, I think it's a legacy issue. Uh, I, it's going to affect Trump uh, because, in part, he's sort of forgotten and ignored his own policy that he adopted and made public back in May. But it's going to affect uh, Biden because, and it already is in terms of the polling, it, he, he's dropped like uh, eight points in, in, in the polls over the last two weeks. But I think the real reason that, that there's a concern, any person when you're in office, you're remembered for the great things you, you do, but quickly those are forgotten when there's big blunders. And the pullout, unfortunately, um, it was done. No, you know, the, the intelligence did not give reports that were were saying, well, you know, the, um, the, the government was going to fall in eight days. But nonetheless, you have to have contingencies. You know, the, all of people's memory is going to be um, everybody trying to get to the airport, people jumping on the plane and falling off the plane, you know, uh, trying to take off. And, and of course, the, the, the people who died um, because of that suicide bomber, I, those are indelible. And it's, it's going to be a, a mark on, uh, on Biden's uh, presidency going forward. David Branham, why is this? This is the question I've been asked. I don't know how to answer it. Biden could have changed everything, right? He could have come in and said, we're not going to honor that commitment. Um, why did he, why was this the hill he chose to stand on? I think because he agreed with it. I think that's the reason why. He wanted to pull out of Afghanistan. Uh, and I think the timing isn't, isn't coincidental. I mean, it's, he's in the first year of his presidency. This is something that even if he kind of blows it, in, in all honesty, most people think he has administratively, mm -hmm. this is a disaster. It's not about politics, it's not about ideology. This is about administering from the office. And this has been a failure. Uh, he's left Americans behind. He's lost soldiers that, you know, in the middle of a uh, pullout. It's, it just doesn't look good. But 
it's in the first year of his presidency. And that's when you want it to happen. If you want, you want a disaster to occur, you want it to happen early on, I mean, it does start to fade from memory after a few years. Uh, I think it'll hurt most in the midterms when the Democrats are trying to get their house, keep their House seats and their Senate seats. I think they're going to get hurt when it gets to the to the general election, which I'm I'm guessing that Biden probably will not even be in that general election. Uh, it's not going to hurt the Democrats that much. I don't believe anyway. I don't think it'll be the lasting memory uh, as, as far as the people voting in 2024. In the history books, though, it'll be there. It'll be there in the history books. Well, let's let's talk to the military historian here. <laughs> um, wh how, how are you going to be teaching this in five, ten years? How are you going to be teaching it tomorrow in your military history classes? Uh, this, is, this is a failure on every level. This is an intelligence failure. This is a military fa failure. This is a policy failure. There's, there's just no upside to this. There's no way you can spin this. Uh, and I'm not being partisan about this. I'm just saying there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, there was a, uh, a letter, an open letter issued, I believe it was two days ago, 90 retired generals and admirals uh, signed uh, saying that the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs should resign. So this was a nonpartisan thing. They're not attacking President Biden. They're attacking the leaders of the United States Armed Forces, and they're saying, you guys deserve blame for this at, at least as much, if not more, than the president. We demand you retire. So if 90 retired generals and admirals are demanding that, that says a lot. Uh, and, and if I can venture into the political science realm, even though I'm a historian, just for a brief thing, there was a Rasmussen poll. Did you see the Rasmussen poll that no. was out today? 50, so Rasmussen isn't a pretty respectable, this isn't you know like Fox News or something. 52% of the people polled thought Biden should resign over this. And that is insane that you would get 52%. Again, it's a poll, you know, we've seen the, the, the fallibility of those things. Mm -hmm. But that kind of shows you in the short term, like David's saying, short term versus long term, what the sense of the of the a lot of people are. Yeah, I believe everybody who voted for Trump wants Biden to resign now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe Some that's the case. Don't believe he really is the president, <laughs> right? So, Trump, so. so um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a mess. Uh, speaking of things that have gone wrong, uh, this year um, I can count on both fingers and toes. Things that have gone wrong that we weren't expecting this year. Now the federal census, uh, it, it was delayed this year because of the COVID pandemic and, and shutdowns and whatnot. We're now getting the numbers. And so the next thing, we've got to follow the Constitution uh, in all 50 states. And this has been on the governor's agenda to do the redistricting. Um, and... Let's talk about this with somebody who, uh, and, and David, this is why I'm glad you're here, because you're a, a veteran of the, the redistricting battles. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, with us the author, well, actually the editor of this book, uh, Steve Bickerstaff, uh, Austin attorney, was, a, was long involved in redistricting over many decades. And uh, he passed away while writing this book. His law partner, uh, Bob uh, and I want to make sure I get his name right, Bob Heath, C. Robert Heath, um, edited the book, Texas Tech University Press published it, so this book, Gerrymandering Texas, is out, and let's go to an interview that I did a few weeks ago with uh, Austin attorney Bob Heath. Now I'm with Robert Heath, who is the author of a new book called Gerrymandering Texas, and uh, Mr. Heath is an attorney in Austin. Mr. Heath, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, and particularly to do something with League of Women Voters, which is a wonderful organization. Now, the, the book was actually, uh, the author is actually Steve uh, Bickerstaff. Can you tell us a little bit about what your relation was to Mr. Bickerstaff and, and what brought you to help edit this book? Yes, uh, Steve and I were or are the founders of this law firm, uh, which is now Bickerstaff, Heath, Delgado, Acosta. Uh, originally, it was Bickerstaff and Heath. There were just two of us. Uh, now, they're about 25. But um, we had also worked together in the attorney general's office uh, before that. So we have practiced law together uh, for quite a while. 
Uh, and Steve was a very uh, great expert on redistricting. In fact, when we started the firm in 1980, um, our first real piece of business was a um, contract he had with the Texas Senate to prepare a guide for redistricting, uh, which we did. He advised the Senate um, in the 1981 session, uh, did uh, represented the state on some of the litigation, had previously done that in the 70s, and I had worked some on redistricting in the 70s as well. Um, and, you know, so he's done a lot of redistricting. A lot of the stuff in the book is, are, are things that he did uh, or advised people on uh, because he was involved in many of the statewide redistricting, certainly local redistricting, uh, from 1980 uh, forward. Uh, he wrote this book. Uh, unfortunately, um, he died in October of 2019. The book was essentially finished, submitted to the publisher, but I ended up doing the final edits and had, had visited with him and worked with him as he was doing the thing. But it's Steve's book. Well, I've got to say that um, it takes a very comp more complex subject than I even realized, and it uh, simplifies it. Now, you've been doing, uh, been involved with redistricting for, uh, for uh, 30 years now. Um, and the book came out in 2020 uh, from Texas Tech University Press. So let me give you my impression. I think this is a common impression of how redistricting works. Every 10 years, uh, we get the census and then we divide up districts in the state uh, according to the population. And that's how we elect our electors. But uh, uh, it, it looks like the process is actually much more complex than that. And without getting, you know, I don't want to, to give away all the, all the, the secrets, <laughs> but can you tell us uh, what is the LRB? All right, the LRB is the Legislative Redistricting Board. And under the Texas Constitution, if the state legislature does not enact a uh, redistricting plan for the House and Senate, um, then the task goes to the Legislative Redistricting Board, which is made up of five officials, four elected statewide, and the Speaker of the House. Uh, that's the Lieutenant Governor, the Attorney General, the Controller, Commissioner of the General Land Office, so the four statewide officials. And so this is an important, uh, an important board, probably more so than most people realize, because it looks like uh, you say that over the past three cycles, um, they've been the ones who determined redistricting. That's correct. And particularly in the 2001 cycle, uh, I think they became a bigger player than normally would be the case. Um, because in that one, the legislature did not pass a plan at all. Um, in, in earlier ones, maybe they passed a plan, courts overturned it, defaulted to the LRB. Uh, here, in, and in 2001, that was where the political fortunes of the state shifted because the Republicans had become the dominant party very clearly by that time where the Democrats were dominant previously in a controlled redistricting, and it was in the Democrat favor. And now the Republicans were going to be in charge. Uh, the House was still Democratic at that time, um, but essentially they defaulted to the LRB by refusing to do a plan, which put that in um, the hands of a board that was primarily Republican. Um, and, and they drew as would be expected uh, and would have been the case if the Democrats had been in control, drew a plan that favored their party. And that really changed the uh, makeup of the um, Texas legislature. 
And so uh, to go back to your book, um, one of the things that uh, appealed to me about it is a lot of its history. Uh, yeah. You go through several chapters of the history, history of redistricting, um, which, which I didn't really know that much about. Um, so that's very informative in the, in the various changes. Uh, in your last couple of chapters, though, you have uh, uh, some information and predictions of what's going to happen this year. Uh, we know we had the census uh, that has been delayed. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's going to mean for redistricting uh, the process in 2021? Yeah, the, the census has been delayed by about six months because of uh, the COVID, the pandemic. Um, and so it's going to be on a much different timetable than normally in this case. Normally, the redistricting census numbers, and there are some different numbers that come out at different times, but the ones that we're most concerned about um, are scheduled to come out by the end of September. Now, in trying to get things to the public more quickly, they, the Census Bureau plans to uh, release what they call a legacy file in on August 16. Um, but that's not very usable. I mean, the general public couldn't, I think, take that and do anything with it uh, because it's not in the same format that will come out a month later. Uh, but um, I'm sure the Legislative Council, Texas Legislative Council, uh, the redistricting software people that we use in the firm because we represent perhaps 100 local jurisdictions on redistricting, uh, will be able to make that usable. So it, it couldn't happen in regular session. Regular session ended before the numbers came out. So there's going to have to be a special session. And they really can't default to the Legislative Redistricting Board because, because the Constitution says if you don't redistrict in the first regular session after the release of the federal census, then it defaults to the redistricting board. Well, the first regular session after the release of the census is going to be 2003 because the census came out after the session. Um, it's not designed to be that way, but this year it happened. So it seems to me LRB is off the table. And Texas has to redistrict because it has gained two new congressional seats. Now, the Legislative Redistricting Board doesn't handle congressional districting at all, but you've got, you know, you can't just stay with the existing seats in the legislature uh, or everything and hope everything will get resolved in 2003 because, at least with congressional seats, you've got two that you've got to do something with. Okay, so. Governor Abbott did not put redistricting, probably because he couldn't, right, on the agenda for this legislative session, which uh, it turns out is a bust because uh, uh, several Democratic lawmakers left, uh, and so they don't have quorum. They can't carry on business. Um, <clears throat> there is talk that it's going to be in the next legislative session, uh, and that was planned in advance, but with the uh, the current legislative session, the first call session, um, being on hold, uh, and Abbott is saying we're going to, you know, keep having legislative sessions again and again until we get what he wants passed. Passed. Um, what? Is, so, is, is this going to default then to the LRB? Well, no, it won't, because uh, at least in my reading of the law, because the LRB is triggered by not redistricting in the regular session, first regular session after release of the census. And the census, the first regular session after release of the census this year is going to be 2003, not 2001. So uh, I think he will call a special session. My assumption had been that it would probably be in October, but that, you know, maybe September. Um, with the numbers perhaps coming out in August rather than September. 
but um, you know, I think it was always contemplated that special session for redistricting would be after the one that's going on right now, and that's going to end in about a week because it's right. thirty days long. So, a couple of things um, that uh, the book brings out. Tell us about the Evanwell decision for, from 2015. Yeah, Evanwell uh, involved, a, to me, a really interesting question. Um, and, and by the way, um, uh, on that, I represented uh, Harris County uh, in preparing an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on that case. Uh, and on a couple of uh, not Harris County, but other jurisdictions on some other cases that went to the Fifth Circuit uh, that preceded Evanwell. Uh, but the question is, who counts in redistricting? What data do you use? Traditionally, what we have used is total population. Count everybody. If you reside in the United States, you're counted in the census. Doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter if you're a citizen, as long as you're a resident, not just passing through. Um, but there have been some people who say, well, you know, we really want to look at people who vote or potentially can vote. Uh, so let's do something like citizen voting age population. That would be number one voting age population, people 18 and above, so you wouldn't count the children because they can't vote, and only citizens of the United States since non-citizens can't vote. Um, and that has partisan, a partisan impact if you do that. Um, and so these cases have been going on for several years trying to uh, get a court to say that that's what you have to do. Evanwell was a case uh, that came out of Texas uh, and involved the state Senate and said that uh, if you look at these districts by CVAP or registered voters or something like that, rather than total population, you see a vast disparity in the size of the districts. They may be equal in population, but very unequal in potential voters. And typically that occurs with Hispanic districts, it's largely Hispanic districts. Uh, and the reason is that the Hispanic population is, uh, has a lower median age, they're younger, so there are more children. Also, uh, there are fewer citizens, and that varies from place to place in Texas, uh, I think Dallas typically has the lowest citizenship rate among adults Hispanic. Houston is a little below that, but still a high non-citizenship rate. Uh, interestingly, the citizenship rate along the border is higher than it is nationwide or statewide, higher still in San Antonio. Um, so it sort of varies from place to place, but um, the 29th congressional district, um, or actually maybe it's the 15th senatorial district, I, I may have the numbers wrong, um, I think was one comparison of where there were a very low number of voters, because there's a largely Hispanic district there in, um, uh, in Houston, and then over in uh, West Texas, for example, or um, west, the hill country west of San Antonio, there was a very high number of voters. Uh, so they weren't equal in voters, although they were equal in population. And the Supreme Court said, you don't have to redistrict, you're not required to redistrict by CVAP, citizen voting age population, or registered voters, anything like that. It's perfectly fine to redistrict by total population, but they didn't rule out the possibility that maybe you could decide to use CVAP. Uh, as a practical matter, that's pretty hard because we don't have good numbers for that. 
uh, the census doesn't ask that question. There's other litigation uh, that went on about that, but that's not something that the census reports in as granular um, way that is useful for redistricting. They, they don't report that at the block level. And they, um, so it, the, the data is just not that good. So what should we be looking for in the upcoming year and as redistricting moves forward? Um, it, it seems like it, even if we're, we're looking at the growing population and if we're looking at counting uh, registered voters versus population, uh, it could affect either party in a variety of ways, some good and some bad. Uh, I, one of the things that you do warn in the book is that probably this election cycle, things aren't going to change very much. Well, yeah, I, I think in, in some respect that's true, although certainly the Republic, anytime you have the House, the Senate, and the governor all being in the same party, then that party can control redistricting and they can do things that will um, inure to their benefit. The Republicans do that. They're in the driver's seat. The Democrats don't have much leverage at all. And so I think what's going to happen is uh, Republicans, and as I said earlier, if Democrats were in control, they'd be trying to draw districts to favor Democrats. Republicans in control, they're going to draw districts to favor Republicans. Um, and so the Republicans are going to draw districts that are favorable to them. Uh, that's particularly important to them because how close the U.S. House of Representatives uh, is. Um, so I, I think one of the things that may happen and mentioned in the book is that uh, some of the minority districts today may become more minority because if you put the minority voters particularly African-American, also Hispanic, um, are typically very high level Democratic voters. If you put them in a single district, maybe they make up 70, 80%, but if you wanna be most efficient, maybe you want them to be a district in a district that's 55%, so it's safe enough to win, but you're not wasting votes that you can put in other districts. Because when you do that, then you make the surrounding districts uh, more able to be non-democratic. So I think that's one of the things uh, that, that will be happening. Now, I think you're probably going to see this. Uh, it's not mentioned in the book because uh, numbers haven't come out or it still haven't come out. But in Kravis County, where I live, uh, Austin is very heavily democratic. Um, and I think it is the largest county in the country that doesn't control its own congressional district. It, uh, you could certainly put a district entirely within the county. They don't because uh, they bring in about five or six districts from surrounding areas so that those districts, those Democratic voters will be submerged in a larger group of Republican voters. Um, and, uh, for example, my, uh, congressman, um, resides up near Fort Worth, uh, but his district comes down to, uh, to Austin. Um, but probably what's going to happen is that they will draw a district wholly within Travis County, um, uh, and say, okay, Travis County and Austin elects is going to elect a Democrat, but then that makes it easier in the surrounding counties to elect Republicans, particularly since there may be some shift in the suburban counties that might be becoming more Democratic. Uh, so if they're not as um, Republican as had been the case, uh, it may make more sense for the Republicans to conscript Democratic voters in the urban areas. 
So what are some of the big challenges uh, to, to wrap up? What are some of the big challenges you see? Uh, and I know you're going to be busy and your law firm is going to be busy uh, starting you know, after September. What are some of the challenges you see coming up? Well, first, in the local redistricting, that's going to be a huge challenge, particularly for counties, because they're going to be on a very truncated uh, time frame because the primaries uh, are in March, unless the legislature changes that, which it may, but filing begins in November. So you talk about starting in September or even in October and filing mid-November, uh, that's going to be very hard to do. I think uh, the legislature may change the primary. I don't think they want to do that, but they could. Um, but it's, it's going to be a big challenge for Democrats because, as I said, they don't have any leverage. Um, you know, I guess they could uh, walk out and break a quorum as they have done uh, in the current one and as happened in 2003. Um, but I don't see an end game in that. Uh, I don't see where it ultimately gets them anywhere. Uh, so uh, I think the Republicans will do what they can to help their cause. Um, the big problem for Republicans, and it's all been the case in uh, redistricting slogan, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. If you cut it too close, if you try to get too many, you run the risk that you start losing those seats um, as the decade goes on. Because if, if you, you know, you want to draw seats, as I said, maybe 55%, not 60 or 70 of your party. Well, if you draw it at 55, 54, 53, whatever, um, those numbers can change and probably will. And districts that look to be reliable for one party may change um, in the course of the decade. And we see that in um, Houston with Liz, Liz, Lizzie Fletcher's uh, victory in the 7th Congressional District, uh, Colin Allred up in Dallas. Um, those districts were drawn to be Republican districts. Democrat records are built up. So yeah, you know, they, they have to be careful not to cut too close. Um, you know, if you reach for too much, you don't, may not get nearly as much as you want. Thank you for being on the show with us this evening, and we hope to speak to you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, so that was C. Robert Heath, uh, Austin attorney, uh, who's worked, uh, he and his firm, uh, and Steve Brickerstaff, his, uh, his uh, late law partner, uh, for 30 years or better on redistricting and talking about the book uh, Gerrymandering Texas. All right, so David, you've had experience with redistricting as well. So I was talking to Mr. Heath several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, you know, what September is going to bring. The census data is starting to come out, has come out. Um, unfortunately, Houston isn't a third largest city. We're still number four. But... <laughs> Is anything going to change as far as representation is concerned? Well, the Republicans were in control of the last redistricting, and they look to be in control of this one. So my guess is that the initial plan, at least, will be strongly in favor of Republicans getting reelected. And, and, and in new seats, it's going to Republicans will probably get elected to a lot of those new seats. Uh, that doesn't mean they'll, they'll get all of them. Uh, there will be provisions made because there are Democrats in the state. You have to put them in a district. Uh, but the gerrymandering will occur. It will make it where Republicans have a better chance of electing a whole lot of people. And Democrats will have less of a chance to, to elect a whole lot of people. What they'll do is they'll pack the Democrats into districts. And the Republicans will have a lot of... 60-40 districts where they have a lot of 60% Republican, 40% Democrats. And the major thing that they'll have to do is keep from keeping the districts from getting diluted as the decade goes by. 
and having the Republicans in no seats uh, end up losing their seats down the line because their district changes. More Democrats come into their district. Uh, and that's a very strong possibility that, you know, that, that could actually uh, be a big problem for the Republicans later in the decade. Bill Flores, what do you see? I mean, I think a, a, a lot of people uh, had this vision, and, and maybe this happens every decade, is that we're done this redistricting and suddenly we're going to see just a sea change. But that's not really accurate, is it? Well, it, most of the growth in the state has been um, non-white, it's and particularly Latino. Uh, you, you look, first of all, uh, 2022, the largest ethnic group in, in Texas is projected to be Latino. Uh, between 2010 and 2020, for every new white Texan, whether they moved into the state or whether they were born here, there were 11 new Latinos in the state. So the population growth and the, when you look at it from the standpoint of who should get those districts, it should be, if it was strictly on population growth, it would be undoubtedly be uh, districts that, or, or cities that have large Latino populations. That's not gonna happen for the reasons that David has, has described. And, and this is a, a, a compounds a problem where there is a, a growth that is not being responded to uh, by the dominant party, in this case, the Republican Party, in, in the sense of um, trying to get their vote and trying to, to adopt policies favorable to the Latino population. And I, I'm saying that from a standpoint that, that you know, to reiterate what, what David was saying, because there is the likelihood, it's not like, like Asians and Latinos and Blacks, um, in, in the old days, they were segregated into communities. There was, there was you know, both uh, legal segregation, but there was also um, uh, situations where they were, they were banking and redlining and lots of things that, that forced people into certain enclaves. There were covenants in, uh, you could not sell your property in fact, some some uh, districts in in Houston, you know, uh, some HOAs still have those and are being sued over it. It's rare, but it, some of them still exist. So, for the most part, that does not exist anymore. As a result, as people's income uh, increases, they move to the suburbs. They move to better education schools. We're going to see the Latino population grow. But we're also going to see it uh, not just concentrated, disperse. Same thing with the Asian population. The, in, the population from China, from India, from much of the Asian world, it has grown in, in Texas and will continue to grow. So the, the issue there is if the Republican Party wants to see that more diversified population become Republican, then it has to adopt policies and practices that are that respond to the needs of those communities. Well, uh, and, hasn't this been an argument? I mean, you even have people like Orlando Sanchez, who's uh, started um, Latino conservatives organization. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, and it's and that and there's definitely <laughs> been a growth in the conservative population. Certainly among Latinos, there has been uh, the the Trump voters, um, you had a lot of Latinos vote mm -hmm. for Trump. Yes. And a lot of areas that have large Latino populations uh, voted for Trump. So, uh, yes, there are inroads being made, definitely. And, and there have been calls for Republicans to be more inclusive. I mean, uh, and, and this was, you know, mm -hmm. a, a number a decade or so ago that uh, there was this concern that they weren't. And that they were going to miss out on a whole bunch of their voters. So there, there have been efforts, and, and there, there have been efforts both ways, right? From minorities who are conservative Absolutely. to the Republican Party, and likewise the Republican Party to the conservatives. The real issue 
um, that I think that uh, often goes under the radar is that there's a lot of minorities uh, and a lot of, uh, of people who, who traditionally you would think of as Democratic voters who have expressed dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party um, likewise be, for, for, for moving too far to the progressive side is one issue. And another issue is that the, the there has been a fear and a criticism that the Democrats have not been responsive to the minority groups that normally vote with them. Uh, they, part of it, part of it is the the Hispanic population in Texas, uh, even though that it's growing and it's it's larger than the non-Hispanic white population in Texas. It's I mean it's very strong population. Whites are not a majority in Texas anymore. They're not. Uh, the thing about the Hispanic population, though, is one, a lot of them are not documented, which means that they're not going to be able to vote. So uh, politicians tend not to respond to them. Two, they have a very young population. Uh, there are more uh, Hispanics that are below 18 years of age than mm -hmm. any other group. And it's a massive population that gets counted in the census, but those, those young people don't vote. And Overall, in the culture, it uh, usually takes a few generations before voting is part of the culture of the Hispanic culture. Uh, but we have it here in, in, in Houston where uh, the, the uh, Denver Harbor area is very strong voting culture among Hispanics who vote in Denver Harbor. And the north side of Houston, mostly first generation, you don't see that. So in the short term, a lot of people ignore the Hispanic population. Republicans often ignore them because they feel like they're inconsequential because they're not going to be at the polls voting one way or another. Uh, Democrats probably get in the same rut where Absolutely. they say, look, yes, this is a growing population. Everybody sees it, but they don't have the political clout yet because they're not at the polls. All of that is going to change. So it's the Republicans who see the future, uh, the George P. Bushes, and they see that who say, look, we need to be inclusive. We need to include Hispanics in our party. We need to embrace them, give them leadership positions, not just say, come vote. You have to have leadership positions in your party. And if those Republicans are looking to the future, the Republicans who aren't doing that are thinking about right now. That's all, you know, and a lot of them are older. They, they're, they're not worried about, you know, what's going to happen in, in 2030. The only thing they care about is 2021. And that's where you see the split among the political parties. Let me uh, jump into something, and, and um, we've got, as I mentioned at the start of the show, 666 new laws on the books. Um, so uh, uh, our legislature has been busy, uh, no doubt about that. One of the things, and I'm, I'm going to be, I want to talk about one that has gotten a lot of attention. I mean, it is the uh, piece of legislation that prompted the Democrats to walk out uh, and leave, go to Washington, D.C. and elsewhere uh, and, and hold up the first called session. And this is on the voter, the, the increased voter restriction. So uh, I'm kind of going out of order and I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Bill Flores because he kind of identified 12 laws. I, I want to come back to those in just a second. But uh, the League of Women Voters uh, had this to say about the re- restrictive thing. He said there were things that the league said were good, uh, or at least th th that made it not as bad as, as many had feared. One was that uh, mail ballot tracking. We were talking about that. That's one of the things. So that people who are mailing in ballots can actually see where that's going. I mean, this is we can see where our Amazon packages are coming. Why not our ballots? Um, <laughs> mail ballot cure. A procedural elected election officials can use to notify voters uh, of errors uh, on mail ballots and an opportunity to fix them. Protection for disability voting accommodations. Uh, protecting procedures already entitled to under federal law. Poll watcher training. This has been a big issue, right? There have been fights over these poll watchers and who can do it. Now they're going to have to go through training, right? They're yeah. going to have to go through training. That makes They're not, sense. not going to be looking over your shoulder while you pull the lever. Right, while, you, while you're counting. <laughs> Increased ballot uh, access for pregnant voters. Increased interpretation access for voters 
Uh, this expands the type of assistance allowed in expanding eligibility for providing assistance. And uh, uh, audible paper trails for election equipment, phasing out equipment, auditable elections, not audible, sorry. Audible, auditable paper, so we can track what happened to these election machines so we don't have the thing uh, like, you know, the uh, MyPillow guys being sued by, uh, what's the name of Is the... It? Oh, yes. Uh, I forgot what that company's called. Yeah, the, 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 you know, there was a lot of... Cyber Ninjas? There's Is that been what a lot of I just have his fear. face in my, my brain right now. I'm sorry. There's been, <laughs> you know, but, 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 but all of these conspiracy uh, he, theories... He's about Dominion, I believe. Dominion, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dominion is the company that made the voting right. machines. And, they're and not, now the, they're suing him. Yeah, yes. um, because yeah. of, yeah. But, but look, like all of that the, spoke to the fear that people were having... Uh, on both sides, right? Is that there's been a lot of these rumors and a lot of speculation, uh, and so it sounds like that in this law, and although a lot of people were against it and there were concerns about it, that there were some things that that did provide some good yeah. remedies for both sides. Right? And I'll, I'll say, I mean, the Democrats were arguing that it was repressive to some voters, and it was all it was all correlation. And I truly believe that the Republicans believe that. I think they're going to be sadly mistaken. I, I don't think, uh, not if you're not able to drive through and vote, I don't think that's going to stop people from going to the polls. That's just going to, you know, the fact that you made the law is going to make, make them make sure they go to the polls. I don't think we're going, we're going to see any voter suppression out of this bill, even though it looks like to some people it is. I think, you know, we saw that with the straight ticket voting. Uh, the straight ticket voting, Democrats still came to vote, and they sit there and pulled every ticket, every every uh, lever on every election. They didn't stop voting and say, well, if I can't vote straight ticket, I'm not going to bother. Uh, that's a very poor assumption. I think people are, they, they vote, are, uh, believe it's a sacred right. And it, because it's a sacred right, they follow through. So I believe in election integrity. I think it's a good thing. Uh, and if, if any of these laws are made for the purpose of suppressing the vote, I just don't think it's going to work. And I, I also think there's an issue there when you talk about the electronic voting. And that, that is scary to a lot of people because once you've, you know, pushed the button and you've cast your vote, how is it being counted? Can people access it? You know, all these questions that have been raised, some legitimately, some illegitimately by people on both sides of the, of, of the aisle, I think that's a legitimate question. There, that is a little scary. It's, it's not like a big clunky, you know, back in the 70s with the machine where you literally are pulling the levers and, you know, that, that's a physical thing or a paper ballot. So you, you can feel a little bit more secure in those kind of things, I think. Uh, okay, but look, it's 2021, almost the end of 2021. I got gotcha. you. You know, at our office where we all teach together, you cannot get on to the silly machine, and, and I have very strong feelings about this, <laughs> without this authentication yep. service, right? That it's drives very painful. me batty. Yes. It's very painful. It is. You can't do bank. You you do banking electronically, right? We do email, secured emails and signatures right. electronically. Why in the world, Bill Flores, can we not vote electronically? You know, I, I think that that the, a lot of the concerns will remedy themselves as the levels of security increase, as encryption continues to, to increase. And as safeguards are built in, um, a lot of companies are already working on uh, toward those goals. You, you know, what troubles me, because I've lived in, in a lot of different states uh, for, for different jobs, is that the, Texas is already has a lot of restrictions. It makes it very difficult for you if you're, if you're um, going to be out of the state uh, or if you're suddenly, uh, you know, in a, in a situation where you're hospitalized to be able to vote by mail and ballot uh, in, in or if you're disabled to have somebody help you. You know, uh, when my mother uh, had uh, become dis disabled, she knew who she wanted to vote for and she could point and she could tell me, you know, but it, it was very difficult. I helped her fill those forms out. Yeah, this is when I was in California. Um, when I was in New Mexico, my father uh, was in New Mexico visiting me when elections came. And so uh, the same thing, he had had a stroke. 
he had had, you know, uh, issues. He could talk, you know, or occur, but I helped him to vote. We sent it in by, by mail and ballot. No problem. Um, one time when, when I was in San Diego, uh, we were able to just drop it off. And there was somebody there at a collection site uh, selecting them. States have been doing this for years, but all of a sudden in Texas, you got to put restrictions. And I think that's the wrong direction to go to. It sends the wrong message. It says that people that are disabled, people that, that are senior citizens, people that might be hospitalized, people that have to work out of state for whatever reason, your vote is questionable and we're going to put restrictions on it. I think it's the wrong message to send to, to anybody. Well, Bill, that's going to have to be the uh, last word. I want to thank you <laughs> for coming in from sunny California uh, to be on the show with us tonight. Uh, Bill Flores, David Branham, uh, Alex Bilikowski, uh, and uh, from Austin, uh, we the interview with uh, Bob Heath, uh, the editor for the book, Gerrymandering Texas. Uh, really good read and very interesting um, and so I thank him for, for, and Texas Tech University Press for helping put us together and, and talk. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight in the League of Women Voters. Bill, I want to follow up. I'm glad you helped your parents vote. I helped my dad, a World War II veteran who served our country in the Pacific, but never voted very regularly until he learned that I turned 18 and I was voting. And he says, I'm going to start voting too. Dad, I'm so proud of you. He goes, yeah, I just want to vote against everybody you vote for. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I love That's your story. dad, Gene. <laughs> so, I'm thank sure you my all. mother voted against who my dad was voting to many times as well. So. <laughs> thank you all for joining us uh, here on this September 2021 edition of Public Affairs Public Access with the League of Women Voters of Houston. Good night. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters. Bye-bye.